Well, today we have another uh, album review for you, a newly released album. This is The Gilded Age, late 19th century for American Wind Band uh, by Newberry's Victorian Cornet Band. It was just released uh, within the past few days. And uh, on the show to talk about it, we have Dr. Michael O'Connor. So welcome back, uh, Dr. O'Connor, and congrats on the new release. Why, thanks. Uh, we've been looking forward to this now for a couple of years, and uh um, the, I gotta say the product came out so much, you know, better than, than I expected. I mean, it was just, it really, really is great. So looking forward to talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great album. So, uh, as you said, you've been looking forward to it for a couple of years. So you guys recorded this back in 2018, I believe. From the That's right. Years. Yeah. Up in, uh, Albany, New York. Um, and we recorded it in 2018. And then of course the fundraising begins after that and, <laughs> you know, to get these things done and uh, it just took a while. Yeah. So, uh, so you guys recorded this one in a studio, and I think you're, the mm -hmm. Newberry's uh, first album, that the music of Thomas Coates, you guys recorded that in a church uh, in Arlington, if I remember correctly from the liner notes. So was that just kind of a, you know, you, you had the studio available kind of deal, or do you guys make a conscious decision to record it in studio rather than in like a more live setting? Well, I'd love to say that there was a whole lot of thought put into that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, with these types of groups, you know, shoestring budget and all that, we um, recorded the first record in uh, that big uh, Lutheran church. And that was because we had it available to us for free. Um, we, we did a concert sort of in, you know, appreciation for the space, but we had some real sonic issues with that one. And I decided we were not going to do that again. And, um, but so we decided to do it in Albany um, at a, uh, actually in an auditorium at um, Union College there, because hmm. um, we have some connections through the band. And uh, it, it turned out that it just didn't work out because of some administrative things over on their end. And um, we appreciate them offering it to us, but there were just, you know, some folks that kind of got in the way of that. And um, fortunately, the person who had sort of turned us on to that also had his own recording studio in North Albany. Hmm. Um, and that was a, a guy named Sten. And, uh, you know, we really, really, um, you know, appreciate him just saying, hey, listen, I sorry this didn't work out, but hey, I've got this recording studio and you guys can use that. So, and that really, really worked out just super well. And I'm, uh, uh, Sten Isaacson was his last name, yeah. Gotcha. Can you maybe talk to us a little bit about the, the thought process behind the concept of the album? Maybe when you decided you wanted to go this direction with, you know, the content of this album and kind of the story of uh, how this album kind of came to be. Sure. Yeah, that was um, we went through several possibilities of, uh, of what to put on the next recording. Uh, of course, the first one was, you know, I wanted to get this, you know, Thomas Coates material out there and it was part of a, a research project I was working on. And so it all kind of came together that way. But this next one, I really wanted to put together some of the pieces that we had been playing in concerts. Some of the things that we found were, you know, sort of the, the, the best of the repertoire that we had run across. And of course, a really wide variety too. This would be something that appealed to a lot more people than say just a, you know, CD of one composer, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we found stuff that, you know, really just represents the era, you know, quick steps, uh, dances, opera arrangements, uh, solos, all of these things. Very cool. So when uh, we had you on the show the first time, uh, I know we kind of talked about the history of Thomas Coates and the history of both of the bands that you run and all that kind of thing, but maybe for having it nice and condensed and all in one place for, for this discussion, can you maybe very briefly discuss how Newberry's Victorian Cornet Band is maybe different from either brass bands before it or the full on concert band wind band tradition that came after it? Sure. Um, Newberry's kind of came out of, you know, my, my original idea was to put together a civil war band back in the early two thousands. And 
um, I, I realized that, you know, the expense of the instruments and, you know, uniform a little bit much. So I started looking around for, okay, well, maybe what comes after that? You know, maybe that might be a little bit more doable. And sure enough, I found all of this repertoire on the Library of Congress American Memory site. And um, this was all from about the 1870s through about the 1890s. I said, hey, this, this looks great, you know? So I did some, you know, digging around to see what, you know, getting the instruments would be like. And mm-hmm. this was sort of the very early days of eBay. And um, these instruments were dirt cheap. Um, and part of that was because they were mass produced in the, uh, the late 1800s. And so there's just a lot more of them. Mm-hmm. And they look a little bit more like today's instruments. So, you know, sort of the collectors of interesting, you know, items, you know, weren't part of who I was competing against. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, you know, the prices just were easy, even for me on a, you know, graduate <laughs> salary, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so I accumulated a few of those. I got some, you know, some folks who were, you know, adventurous to try them out. And, you know, just over the years, we picked up, you know, better players, better instruments. And, um, we finally got to the point where, Hey, you know, let's, let's record this group. You know, it sounds good. Yeah. And, definitely. um, and that's kind of where we went from there. But the biggest thing was I noticed that no one, I mean, literally no one was performing and recording this music. And I thought, mm-hmm. well, that's a great place to jump in because there's literally no competition, yeah. you know, and, and, and nobody, you know, to be compared against yet other than you know, our own professional standards. Mm-hmm. Definitely. The title of the album is The Gilded Age. What is that title in, in reference to and, and what is that time frame considered to be? Well, you'll get arguments about what exactly the Gilded Age is, but, you know, from my perspective, it's the, you know, right after the Civil War, about 1875 through about 1895, you know, right in there, or maybe even all the way up to 1900. This was the time where, you know, we had this, you know, time of unfettered capitalism and, um, you know, some things really, really developed well and, and other folks were a little bit left behind. And so, you know, this sort of was the, you know, the predecessor to the progressive age in which, you know, sort of rectified a few of those things, you know, for the, you know, the rest of us. Hmm. But the, um, you know, I mean, we had some people, you know, just incredible wealth, like, you know, the railroad barons, you know, the oil barons, these people. And, you know, these people also were great philanthropists too. And so, you know, the arts benefited quite a bit from, you know, their largesse. Um, but it was also just a time of, you know, technological development. This is, you know, leading up to when the airplane is developed. It's leading you know, up to when the car is developed. It's, you know, all of that stuff that kind of gets us to that point. And so it was just a very, very exciting time. And also a time when the uh, publishing in- industry in America really develops so that, you know, bands out in North Dakota can actually order a set of, you know, instruments and a set of music and, you know, get it mail ordered to them. And so that really sort of developed band music in America. Mm-hmm. For sure. When I was listening to the the recording, uh, you know, my my ear is so used to now the all brass band sound and then the the modern wind band sound with the large number of woodwinds. And I found myself when I was listening to this album hearing, what is it, maybe five woodwinds, maybe all together in the ensemble, somewhere around there. Actually six. That, six. That mm-hmm. the the timbre of the ensemble to me was kind of reminding me of like a, a German wind band where it's very brass dominated and had kind of a few, uh, you know, woodwinds kind of sprinkled in there. And then especially when the group is playing, you know, the marches or something like the more waltz or polka like, like songs, you know, I thought that that sound was really coming across. Is there that type of German influence in, in this type of music and, and ensemble as well? Well, there's German influence in literally everything in American music in the 19th century, because most of the the, uh, musicians who played in the United States were of either German descent or German immigrants. True. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, we had a group of Italians that comes in a bit later. um, And, you know, and then, of course, a lot of traditional, you know, players from Ireland, England, places like that. But as far as brass players, woodwind players, these were almost all Germans. And so naturally, some of that is going to show up in the arrangements, the, um, you know, the style of the music, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And of course, a lot of the arrangers that you see, you know, attached to the, the titles here, these all have German last names. So, you know, it's just a natural thing that, you know, their tradition is going to come through. But mm-hmm. also, you know, with people like Sousa, you know, I mean, they are starting to use European style uh, orchestrations for band. And, um, and then there's the tradition of, you know, I've got this clarinet player friend 
and you know, he wants to play in our brass band. Oh, we'll just we'll double him up on a cornet part. You know, it'll, it'll just you know, it'll help the sound a bit. And a lot of that, you know, it's sort of informal. You know, the arrangers start looking at the bands in their area. Say, okay, who's playing in these bands? All right, well, I'll write parts for everything I see here. Mm-hmm. And then for us, it was a matter of looking at literally hundreds of photographs. Mm-hmm. Bands love to have pictures taken of themselves. They still do. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have so much data to go on. You know, okay, you know, look at this, you know, so I see, I see, you know, like six cornet players, I see one each on the lower brass instruments, maybe two tubas, I see, you know, two, three, four cornet players as the pictures get later and later, you start seeing more and more of them. Mm-hmm. And occasionally, even in the 1900s, or the 1800s, you'll even see like a lone saxophone player in there. Oh, well. Uh, we didn't go that far. I mean, that was just the line we weren't willing to cross. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. hilarious. So I saw on the liner notes that um, all the additions you guys uh, used or played off of for this were were done by you. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what um, editorial decisions you made when you were going through uh, all these scores and stuff? Or was, was that kind of just... Um, to codify the style and fix, you know, any, you know, printing errors or, or stuff like that. Right. I, I try to use a light touch when I'm doing editing on this, because I really want, you know, what was originally in the, the music to come through as much as possible. In fact, I sometimes go a little too far. Um, some of the um, optional instruments that they list on these scorings, um, I, I went ahead and added them in too, just so we could hear what the whole thing sounded like if you know you had that optimal setup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So some of the larger arrangements, you know, for example, it would say uh, two tenor trombones and then two optional tenor valve instruments. And as I looked at the the parts, I said, oh, I'm mostly doubling, uh, but on some of them they were no, the tenors are playing over here and the trombones are playing over here, and, and it would be good to have both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, in the cases where they were literally just doubling, I, I didn't bother to add those in because, you know, that would, that truly was an option. Mm-hmm. But as I go through, um, because there are no scores, of course, they're just parts that you find. Mm-hmm. And so you have to put them into a finale and score it out. And then you realize on most of these things, and I think it was just this joke that the period uh, um, arrangers were doing on later editors in which they would take a, a certain section and uh, half the band is playing piano and the other half the band is playing four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so, and you know, it's obviously not supposed to be that way, but they're just saying, okay, you know, 21st century editor, you make the decision here. <laughs> yeah. Right. So there was a lot of coin flipping involved in some of these decisions, you know, um, mm-hmm. and actually I, you take a look, some of them are obvious, but some of them are like, all right, is it mezzo forte or is it forte? Uh, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we just kind of figure, okay, you know, what's going to work the best here? And um, articulation the same way. Um, I literally see sections in the same section, like in the cornet section, where one guy is playing a section slurred and another one's playing, it's all accented. Hmm. Hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, was there, there, was there no quality control whatsoever? Yeah. <laughs> um, and apparently, the you know, that question answers itself. Right. But, um, yeah, so you just kind of you, you make a decision here and there. Decide, okay, I, you know this, this is a lyrical section, so no, we're not going to accent these notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was able to listen to this album a number of times, and I think in the middle of my first listening, I think I sent you a message, Doctor O'Connor, and I was like, "This is real premier playing and a real example of you know this style of music and this type of ensemble at like its highest, most proficient form." And I think the the playing and the the mixing and the arranging and the playing, all this stuff is super fantastic on this recording. Um, I was wondering, maybe it would be nice, maybe we can go around and each uh, select maybe uh, our favorite or our, a notable recording on the album. Uh, and I'll go first. I thought that the the first track on the album uh, written by Gilmore mm-hmm. uh, titled, hang on. I always forget the name because it's so un- it's so uncommon. Salute to <laughs> New York March. Yeah, yeah, we always know of Gilmore as this band leader, as a cornetist, as the writer of When Johnny Comes Marching Home. We know that he was a composer and wrote other things, but those things are not well known. Much much of it is lost. So it's really really cool getting to hear this high quality performance of this other you know Gilmore piece. <laughs> Thank you. 
can you maybe talk a little bit about the the march <laughs> salute to new york march right um i wanted to include a gilmore piece on here because he was really the i mean it's not going too far to say he was the preeminent musician in the united states in you know the 1870s and, and early 1880s um his band um if you just look at it from a popularity standpoint was at least as big as the Sousa band who was later um, and maybe not even more famous. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was just absolutely huge. Um, you know, when he traveled around, I mean, he just had giant crowds coming out to hear him play. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as far as his, his compositions go, there are very, very few band compositions with his name on it. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I know he did some arrangements under a pseudonym. We're not exactly sure what that, pseudonym was hmm. but he also had an arranger in the band who was fantastic and gotcha. he did most of the stuff for uh for gilmore's band um so yeah when you find a, a, an actual gilmore piece that's not like from the 1840s or 1850s um mm. yeah you go ahead and do it yeah definitely. i found only one other recording of this and it was the marine band doing it and they do a super job with it mm-hmm. um so we can say ours is the first period performance and and i appreciate your your, your compliments on the playing um, it's just that one's a little bit tricky to put together because um, there's really all of the sections are kind of exposed in it. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of glue that holds it together. I think you know what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and um, and so everybody has to really be on their game to make that one work. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, you know, Gilmore was not, you know, a top band arranger himself, you know. For so, sure. yeah. um, you know, he, his his skill was in marketing more than anything. Gotcha. And, um, and of course, leading the band, he was a good musician, of course. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, um, there's, uh, there are people doing research on Gilmore now who could probably talk a lot more about it than I can, but, um, yeah, we really wanted to include something by Gilmore on there. Awesome. Yeah. Steven, you have a, a favorite or standout track from the album? Uh, yeah, well, well, first, I mean, I want to echo everything that Chris said about the playing on the album. It is, it is fantastic. And it's got really kind of that, like a nostalgic sound for me. Uh, it, it, um, it reminds me, and maybe we can talk about it later, but the structure of the album really kind of does remind me of some of the community band concerts that I've played and like how it's structured, you know, where you start with a March, you have an overture kind of towards the top and then your solos are sprinkled throughout, you know, the, the rest of the program. And then you end, you know, with the big, uh, you know, transcription of some kind, which is exactly kind of how the album's structured, but, um, yeah, fantastic playing. And, for me, uh, the the soloists on this album all are phenomenal, but I'm going to go with the first soloist that <laughs> appears on the album. Well, you pick mine, man. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was I was worried about that, but uh, but yeah, so so Dominic Giardino, his he he's the clarinet soloist on the third track, the Fantasia La Sonambula. Oh wow, I'm going to try that again, Fantasia La Sonambula. I am terrible with with languages, but um, the playing there, you know, both the solo and the ensemble playing really gels uh, well on that. All the solos, but that one in particular, I really enjoyed. Yeah, Dominic worked very, very hard on that. In fact, he's the one who suggested the solo. And um, when he came in to uh, play it for the recording, I mean, literally you could hear everyone's jaws hit the floor. Um, we, I mean, we knew Dominic was good. I, the thing is, most of us have known him since he was in high school, mm-hmm. you know, down in Key West, and that's where we first met him. And, um, and yeah, we knew he was, he was a good sort of precocious uh, uh, clarinet player. We didn't get a chance to hear him much down there because he was mostly drum major in the Civil War band down there. Um, but when I heard him later on, like, uh, he did a, a appearance on from the top mm-hmm. and, um, you know, I said, wow, this, this, this guy really, you know, he's, he's got some, some real talent there. 
And then of course, you know, he went on and I've heard some more recordings that he's put on YouTube and I said, wow, this, this guy's, you know, he's going to be one of the best. And so we were just absolutely pleased to have him, you know, do a solo with us. Um, I don't really like the uh, accompaniment parts as much on this one. I don't think, you know, they're as um, well uh, scored. I mean, everybody played them great, mm -hmm. but just as far as the, the arrangement goes, um, I, I thought, the, you know, Cavallini could have been a little bit, no, or Carney, perhaps, uh, you know, the uh, band ranger could have been a little bit more imaginative there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's standard for its day. And again, Dominic just, I just played his rear end off on that one. <laughs> yeah. Sure, I agree. Definitely. Do you have any particular uh, piece that kind of stands out to you, Dr. O'Connor, from the recording, either maybe like kind of stepping back and seeing it all in hand, able to hold it all in your hand in the recording, or maybe like a memory from when you were actually recording? Any Anything stand out? Well, I'm going to do the usual uh, dodge. And, <laughs> 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 and say that there are several on here that, that um, I'm particularly proud of. And number one, of course, is the one that we just mentioned, the La Sanambula, um, the Bellini that, that, um, that Dominic did. That's the one I really like listening to because I, I like listening to him play on that. And I'm just thinking, wow, this really makes this record go from, you know, this group of really fine professionals, you know, playing, you know, this, this old music to, hey, this is something we could play on public radio. You know, this is, this is something we, you know, that I would be proud to say, hey, that's us, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, definitely. I really like the, um, oh gosh, what's the other one? Um, you know, for me, I think Semper Fidelis. You know, it's, it's, it's a, something we've all played and something we all know really well, but this is the first period instrument recording of it. And when I go back and listen to the actual recording and let me take this opportunity to do a call out for Richard Price, who's our engineer on this. Um, the guy is an absolute magician. Uh, you know, he has his golden ears and, you know, he would stop us, you know, all the time and say, it, he had a, he had a wonderful way of putting it too. He says, you know, I don't think you're going to love that last one. <laughs> you know, I feel like we're bringing a guy like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what he meant, <laughs> right? He's saving and, you time. He's saving you time. <laughs> yeah. And so when I would listen to the raw recordings of it too, and the way he mixed this was absolutely fabulous too, because you know the raw recordings, the clarinets were just you know, like totally in your face because um, you know we're in this room and you know they're bouncing off the walls and that sort of thing, but. In the end, you know, we get a sound of more like what a band like this would have sounded like, you know, predominantly brass, you know, with the clarinets really just adding another layer of, you know, sonority to it. But anyway, so when I heard the Semper Fidelis, I said, wow, that's, that came out really, really well, you know, and it sounds good with the period instruments. And, um, you know, I'm glad that people will get a chance to hear, you know, what it might have sounded like the by the Marine Band in those days. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess my favorite one is the uh, Serenade Goodnight Beloved. Mm -hmm. I always really love playing that one because most of these arrangements tend to be still, you know, um, in the stage of you have all these instruments playing the melody, you have some instruments playing, you know, kind of the umpa, you know, harmony parts. Mm -hmm. um, but this one gave us a chance to really play in a very sort of uh, chorale style. in which everybody gets good, you know, you know, harmony parts and everything is moving, you know, in counter lines and things like that. And that's, we, we play that pretty much every year when we go to uh, the Vintage Band Festival. Here's a call out for the Vintage Band Festival in Northfield, Minnesota, which happens uh, every three years. Uh, if you want to hear some really, really great bands, both old and new, um, you know, look that up for the next time that, that that's offered. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we, we've been there every year since it's existed. And uh, we really appreciate them inviting us for that. Um, and I also have to mention to the uh, I am up quick step. I was really glad to, you know, we after we did the Thomas Coates recording, then I, you know, Mark Elrod calls me up and said, oh, hey, I've got this other Thomas Coates piece, you know, you know, that you might want to play sometime. They go, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> we had room on the last recording because we did some filler pieces, too. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> So anyway, so we had to put them on there, of course. You know, and this is uh, one of his last pieces. It's like 1894, I think it was published. Okay. Yeah, well. um, I have to go back and look at that again. But, you know, right up into his 90s, he's still cranking up band pieces. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Here's a guy who was, people knew about him in the 1840s. Yeah. Yeah, wow. man. <laughs> he's around for like the whole movement. It's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In fact, I was just I was listening to a radio broadcast the other day when they were talking about um, it was uh, Jack Benny's uh, birthday, and he was born in 1895. And I thought, wow, Jack Benny and Thomas Coates lived at the same time for one year. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that just, that just kind of blew my mind. Yeah, 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 I that's, Jack Benny. <laughs> yeah it's crazy learning about those like overlaps like that and and thinking about it, it's crazy. Yeah. I'll say while we're quickly on this, another one that I really enjoyed was uh, the second track, the the Yankee Tickle medley. Oh yeah, um, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, specifically for all the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, tunes that are in there. Um, my my fiance has been; she was actually in Iolanthe at Penn State. Okay. That, that was one of the operas they did there, um, and she's been in one other one. I think the the Pirates of Penzance. She's been in uh, twice actually. Um, but yeah, I always love the Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, you know, like opera, operetta overtures. They're always a lot of fun to play. So that, that was cool to hear in there. Yeah, and for me, the, I got that one out thinking, okay, Yankee Tickle, that's going to be, he's going to have some patriotic stuff in there. It's going to maybe some, you know, local color, New England sort of things. And it is the most hodgepodge yeah. group <laughs> <laughs> of things. It was like, what can I get the rights to, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do 10 bars of it. <laughs> yeah. And, so, you know, this is like a total, like, you know, here's like every tune that you know from this year, you know, we're going to play it, you know, in this one arrangement. Yeah, it's like a sampler. <laughs> yeah, so it's got like a mix of you know the Gilbert and Sullivan, some you know you know quasi minstrel sounding things. Uh, uh, some uh, there's a little Haydn thing in, stuck in there, I think, as yeah. I recall. And so there's, there's some just, Strauss you Gounod know, in there as well. To do, you know, because you know it's like you know, hey, if you don't like this thing, just wait two seconds. You're going to go on to something else. <laughs> yeah, you know, that <laughs> <laughs> man, that's crazy. Yeah, and then. Uh, you know, all, all the soloists, you know, on this recording were fantastic. You know, we, I know that we already were able to spend some time with, uh, with Dominic, but then, you know, we also have Christine Erlander Beard and Don Johnson, the third playing, uh, on this recording. Also, I know with the, uh, the battle cry of freedom, uh, solo variations, you know, we always see that piece, you know, kind of pop up on, on all these early band uh, recordings. So it was really nice to hear a solo, a theme and variation, a completely different arrangement than we're used to hearing on this recording. So I, that was a nice little surprise. Again, seeing it, the track title as I'm going through listening and it's getting closer and closer. And then when it finally showed up, it was completely different from what I expected, which was awesome.
Yeah, um, and, and that kind of goes into part of the story behind the, the genesis of this too, is the original idea was uh, our band was doing a uh, performance at Tennessee Tech as part of Winston Morris's 50th anniversary there. And um, right before we went up to do that, we found out that uh, Don Johnson had passed away um, very you know suddenly. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys knew Don, but he was a, an amazing, you know, trumpet player who basically took 20 something years off the horn, uh, you know, to be a fireman in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And um, then he decided to get back into it. And so I started seeing him at places like, you know, the uh, Oberlin Early Music you know, thing that they do every year, um, Historic Brass Society things. And he was the epitome of the Southern gentleman. I mean, this guy would give you the shirt off of his back. Hmm. Um, I mean, and, and I, I do mean that literally. <laughs> <laughs> if you needed a shirt, he, he would be the very first guy there, you know, to give you his. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he was always encouraging of younger players. And he was the kind of guy who, you know, if he was in a group and there were some players who just, you know, weren't really up to the level of the rest of the group, he was their best friend. You know, in fact, you know, there's a there's a great story I could tell you in, in another circumstance about that. But um, so anyway, you know, he had played with us before, um, you know, when we did a, a gig in Tennessee, I believe. And uh, he played with the Federal City Brass Band, the rest of us. And so he was just, you know, we, we loved Don. And when we find out that he was just gone, you know, um, I allowed or allowed. I mean, I I. I let a couple of our guys go to his funeral while we were at that gig, hmm. you know, during our rehearsal. So they, they were able to run up to Kentucky, uh, attend the funeral on our, uh, you, know, you know, kind of representing us and then come back and do the performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of the album was let's, let's do something, you know, dedicated to Don, you know, because, you know, he was, he was somebody that everybody knew. And Don, one of the things he was known for was collecting JW Pepper instruments Mm -hmm. And sort of putting together a scratch um, serial number list mm -hmm. because, you know, the serial numbers for JW Pepper were destroyed in the Philadelphia fire back in, I want to say the 1880s or something like that, um, or maybe a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a serial number list for the JW Pepper instruments. Mm -hmm. And so JW Pepper also published music just like they do now. Um, and so we were going to do an album um, playing all J.W. Pepper range, you know, uh, publications from the uh, 1880s, you know, 70s, something there, and, uh, and play my J.W. Pepper instruments because, mm. you know, Don had a collection there, too. And his son, who is a uh, has a doctorate in uh, trumpet, could also come and, you know, play with us and and bring the instruments. And so I approached uh, J.W. Pepper about that. And at first they were very excited about the idea. And then um, it just fell apart uh, from, mm. you know very very business reasons <laughs> mm. uh, that's that's as far as i'll go with that <laughs> but um but so i so i had to change plans i wasn't going to do a jw pepper recording now that you know that they had kind of backed out on us and so i decided to uh do one that you know had this wide variety of the stuff that we've been playing like i, I mentioned before but i still wanted to do at least one track you know to honor don <laughs> And so I found this arrangement of Battle Cry of Freedom because he was a big, you know, fan of playing Civil War instruments. And, um, and of course, he had the instrument and he had, you know, a son very capable of playing, you know, a very fine solo. So I would bring him in, you know, play this in, in honor of his dad. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And like I said, it's, it's just such a fun piece. Also, I'm really glad you guys included it. It's not that easy. That, that is a very, very difficult one to play. Yeah, mm -hmm, I bet. Yeah. And so, um, but while we're on the topic, let me also bring up uh, Christy Beard, one of my favorite people in the world. I mean, <laughs> Christy is just, she is just an absolute delight. Uh, she and her husband, uh, Michael, both play in the band. Nice. And, um, you know, Christy, you know, came and played with us for the first time, the first time we did the Vintage Band Festival in, I want to say, like 2006. And um, she was actually kind of um, suggested to us by the, um, the coordinator of the festival because she wanted to come up and play something and she didn't really have a group to play with. Mm -hmm. So we said, yeah, yeah, we, we use piccolo. So yeah, have her come on in and, and, and play. And we knew she taught at the University of Nebraska Omaha. So we figured she could read this stuff down. Mm -hmm. And um, she played so well. And she was such, a, you know, again, was such a wonderful person to have in the group 
that, you know, every time that we've done anything of, you know, high profile that, you know, that she could get to, we've made sure that she's played with us. Mm -hmm. And she's played a couple of different piccolo solos with this. Um, this is the most recent. So we decided to go with the August Dom piece uh, mm -hmm. through the air that, like I was mentioning before we started, that uh, every piccolo player knows this piece. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of cool to have a period instrument performance of it. Definitely. And she just, you know, like always, just just really killed it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And speaking of the instruments itself, too, people will notice when they purchase the the physical copies of these CDs in the liner notes. You guys do have written out all the instruments that were utilized in the recording. So, uh, you know, instrument buffs, it'll be able to kind of get their fill of the period instruments that were used on this on this recording by reading the liner notes right. yeah. and mouthpieces. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's, that's the real hard one because I mean, I mean, I, I don't have any disrespect for the uh, bands who play on modern mouthpieces because so many of those guys, you know, they have to play modern instruments for a living. And so they don't want to be bouncing back and forth and that sort of thing. And it, it, mm -hmm. it does make the period instrument sound a little bit smoother, but we just are very, very, very uh, adamant about the fact that the period mouthpiece makes the instrument sound like the instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, sure. it's, you know, the instrument, you know, speaks in its old voice with that mouthpiece. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We, we've had a number of guests on the show and, and I think basically everybody that's in the, the realm, in that camp of period mouthpiece, you know, all echoes similar things, you know, that the, these instruments can be played obviously, and are played on modern mouthpieces and, you know, to, great success, you know, good for, for those groups, but with the, the period mouthpieces, exactly what you're saying is, especially intonation. It seems like the, the instrument wants to agree with your ear a little bit easier <laughs> when you're, when you're on the proper mouthpiece. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say modern piccolo is probably is squirrely enough. So I can't imagine playing that on a, on a period instrument. I don't know how they compare. Cause I'm not, you know, well-versed in, in woodwind instruments, but, um, yeah, I, I was super impressed by uh, by her playing as well on that on that solo. Yeah, Christy, um, she's not playing on a D flat instrument. Uh, she's playing on a C piccolo, but it is a C piccolo from the period. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's sometimes I don't have time to to transcribe the uh, music, so I have to hand her a D flat part, and she's playing a half step off of <laughs> the music. And your piccolo parts, you know, they're not whole notes. No. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, yeah. She, she's amazing. Um, and so, um, yeah, like, so it is, it is a period sound. It's just, um, you know, she's playing a, a C piccolo instead of a D flat. Yeah. And it's a very fine one too. I mean, she's had, you know, some of the best, of uh, you know, woodwind, uh, you know, repair restorers had, you know, work on that little Rudy cartel instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neat. So before we, we steer listeners to where they can purchase the recording. Now, obviously it'll be printed, you know, in the, the description and stuff of this release, but are there any other, any final thoughts or observations or, or anything that you wanted to bring up about the album, Dr. O'Connor? I just like to say for, for anybody out there, and, and I know a lot of, um, you know, period players listen to these, these podcasts, at least if they don't, they should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, the recording process is a process and I'm not talking about just, you know, the days you go in and do the recording. I'm talking about, you make your first recording, you make your second, you make your third. And, and during each of those processes, you learn a ton about, you know, that process. And especially with these instruments, I mean, you may be someone who, uh, you know, who has performed, you know, uh, on recordings in studios, like for jazz or for commercial stuff. 
but coming in and playing these instruments, you know, and doing it in a live situation, it's a very, very different thing. And so we've learned an awful lot. And by the time we've gotten to this recording, which I think I feel like for most of this, we've kind of gotten to the point where, hey, I feel like we know how to do this now. <laughs> and the sound actually says that, you know, rather than just, you know, me kind of imagining it. <laughs> but, you know, like this is a recording, you know, if I got from somebody, I, I would be impressed by it too. You know, and I, and I think all of us, you know, we're all very critical about our own playing and our own recording and that sort of thing. And, you know, you talk to, you know, these people have been recording forever and they'll talk to the same things. I don't listen to my own recordings, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, this one I'll put in the CD and I'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's this, this recording, you know, not that it's not necessarily the case, even with your guys's first recording or anything, but specifically, and especially with this recording, it's definitely surpassed the, uh, the threshold of like a novelty recording, you know, like you're definitely not doing it just mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, a, a little interesting thing to do and a chance for people to play these instruments that they've been collecting. No, you guys like legitimately made fantastic, beautiful, entertaining music that, you know, it, that, uh, extends beyond just, you know, the people that listen to this podcast, you know, it, it has a very wide appeal, I think, because of the quality of the playing of the arranging, you know, all these things together definitely came together, definitely came together in this recording. I think it's pretty evident. Right. And I think our, our next step in recording would be to try to record pieces that we've that we've played a lot just prior to actually doing the recording. Mm -hmm. um, because of the nature of our group, we're spread out all over the country. Um, all of these pieces we've played. I don't think I brought in anything that we had not performed live before, except for perhaps the Yankee Tickle Medley. Um, we had not played that one live before. Um, but all these we've done at the Vintage Band Festival. And so you know, everybody came in familiar, but, you know, it's not like coming, you know, stepping off of a tour bus and right into the recording studio, which I, to me is, is like the optimal way to do it, mm -hmm. you know, so that, you know, you just have that whole musical concept, you know, just sort of ready to go. Um, you know, it took a little work, but I, I think in the end it, it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Totally cool. agree. So where, uh, where can people go if they want to pick up a copy and, I strongly suggest that they do. <laughs> it is a fantastic <laughs> recording. So um, where, where's a good place to point people to if they want to pick one up? Um, I recommend going straight to the MSR Classics uh, website to get yours. Um, they're very efficient in sending out CDs, but also, um, you know, more of the money that you just spent will go to us and to an independent music label um, than going through Amazon. Amazon um, you'll eventually be able to get them there, of course, but, um, you know, anybody who sold anything through Amazon, you know, that you just don't make anything, you know, you're, you're basically trading this wide, you know, distribution for, you know, um, you know, props. So www.msrcd.com is where you can go and pick this up. And it's on the new releases on right on the front page there. Awesome. And we'll be sure to use that link on our website's discography page. Mm -hmm. If you go to the discography and scroll down to Newberry's Victorian Cornet Band, you'll see a picture of the album and a purchase link. And that purchase link will bring you to the link that Dr. O'Connor just mentioned. So you can do it that way as well. Right. The guy who uh, runs MSR uh, Classics, uh, uh, Robert Laporta, is doing some wonderful, wonderful things for uh, independent musicians. Um, there's a whole bunch of great classical CDs on that site. Uh, there's you know, all of ours are, are there as well. And he, he really loves to do these sorts of things, which are, you know, I mean, they're for him, they're not the most profitable things in the world, but you know, they are they're, they're, the music that needs to be recorded and heard. Mm -hmm. Definitely for sure. Yeah. And we thank you guys for, for doing that, for recording it and letting us hear it. It was, it was beautiful and, and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Michael O'Connor, for speaking with us today about Newberry Victorian's Cornet Band's latest CD, The Gilded Age. We highly encourage everybody to go check it out. Uh, again, link will be included on our website and in the description of this release. And uh, thank you again so much. Hey, it's always my pleasure, guys, and I hope to talk to you again really, really soon. You're doing great work here. Thank you so much. Thank you.